career development and how in Sri Lanka we could go ahead with this. Uh, and when I was going around listening to your uh, discussions with the faculty, these are some of the things I heard. No fund, no facilities, and no research. That's one thing. So I can show you what, how we started without all these. And uh, I mean, you take a problem, and the problem was pertaining to a national problem. So, was the killer number three? Sri Lanka was killer number two, and of course, the problem was uh, we had very high incidence of young stroke, which is about 33 percent as compared to the rest. What did I do? I just took autopsy brains, which you don't have any money, need any money. It's just thrown off. Right. We took the blood vessels and we studied the anatomy. You measure the diameter, you don't need money. And we did a 400 autopsies, adults and people. And you could see we have got five publications, four in PubMed and one in Sri Lankan journal. So, this study actually gave us a, a strong predisposition to anatomical vascular factors for stroke in Sri Lanka. And in short, what it said was, these studies, which we did in anatomy and pathology, what we found was population are more prone to stroke. From there, actually what happened was, the National Institute of Singapore was, uh, uh, we started with international collaboration now. So therefore, it started with some, nothing, and now moving ahead. And they were interested in this. And then, of course, why was this cerebral arteries? And they went into study on microarray. They completely funded this. And uh, what we did was, we did some microarray studies upregulation and down regulation. We just studied and the data just came in and we are now analyzing this data. So what I showed you was I started with nothing and the funding came. So then the next second, second question most of the clinical people was saying was we are clinicians, we are clinicians. Uh, <coughs> research in clinical we don't like lab work and we are doctors. I mean, okay, when you work, still you can do research. Only thing, your mind should be set. I mean, from Dr. Ranjani Gamage's ward, the Neurology Institute, we collected all the data of the young strokes, 45, less than 45 years, because there was 33% of strokes here were young. So it's a national problem. And we were able to uh, uh, published this data in 2009, young stroke in Sri Lanka are non-solved problem. The conclusion we got was, uh, I mean, 18 percent of these people had a family history, and 86 percent were female, and 70 percent there was no uh, uh, conventional risk factor. That took us into another collaboration, which is we are funded now by clinical neuroscience, by the Imperial College London, and one of our students will be working on genetics of strokes. And uh, we have got one publication already, in DNC Medical Genetics, 2011. And also we have just put up a, 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 a paper to the uh, two risk factors, strokes in South Asia and across the two continents, American Association of Neurologists and Association of British Neurologists in conference in October 2008. So here what we did was, we were looking into the genetics of strokes in India, All India Institute of Medical Science, Sri Lanka, then number three, there is the UK with Imperial College in the India. So the money came in, we are moving in. So there's, so therefore, then of course we had this problem and uh, we again started collaborating with the uh, Department of Molecular Neurology in point of presidential university to find out why these problems of strokes. And we were able to isolate uh, the first 
in published in clinical neuroscience in uh, 2010. Yeah. Uh, cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarct and lymphopathy, which is called cadaxi, a patient from Sri Lanka. And we isolated the first pro protogenic mutation among the Sri Lankan population, resulting in a uh, mutation. And this substitution from 16 to glycine at 4 and 16 is reported in the first time, and it has not been reported before. So here we moved on, we got international cooperation, and we are going ahead. Then, of course, uh, we moved into again getting a chest patient. We know the dementia. Over 16, world is aging, and you can see all these countries Asia, China, Japan, all are aging. So, obviously, it's simple things what we did. We um, studied uh, the publications in 2006 in and in neural injury, current Alzheimer's research. And very simple thing, these are not, MBBS people are not needed for this. These were done by uh, uh, BSc graduates. We did the minimal state examination from a sample of Sri Lanka and we got the International Journal of Geriatrics and Psychiatry. That was in 2009. Then, of course, we were honored to, because Sri Lanka then had nothing to start with. They didn't have uh, tools, they didn't have how to proceed, right? So we had to make all these to validate the functional screening of dementia. And one was uh, Bristol and breast activity, this BMC research, and you could see these are all in the public, right? And validation of geriatric depression scale in the Journal of Psychiatry. So these are all patients. If you that's all. You don't need money for this. Right. Then I could, uh, I could also hear some other uh, participants were telling the faculty, we are having a holistic approach. It's a philosophy. And how is, how scientific is the philosophy? And some of the students really presented very nicely today. Uh, and is it evidence based? If so, how? And here again, I would like to show. We have a lot of natural products and, and one of the areas we work for steam. And again here, we went with the National University of Singapore and we were funded as a team. What did we do? We did the therapeutic effect of flavor. This was a PhD. Uh, therapeutic effect of flavor night from Ceylon Green on hypoxic brain epithelial cells. I mean, this was actually done in the lab of National University of Singapore. We cultured the human brain epithelial cells and we demonstrated that the ability of Ceylon green tea is to display cerebral protective effect. We did a whole heap of things. We did biochemistry, we did immunohistochemistry, chemistry, we look for genes. I mean, all this is in public. You can just get. And where did we end up? We got the tea board to state, made a statement. And they said, this refers to the research work that have completed on health benefits of Ceylon green tea. So Sri Lanka took a tea board, appreciated the importance of such a research study, for the promotion of Ceylon tea and it will contribute immensely for marketing of Ceylon green tea in overseas market. Tea tester employed directly and indirectly over 1.5 million people in Sri Lanka. Hence, we trust that the results of our research will, will be great booster for tea industry in Sri Lanka. And since we published this data, I mean, we could see the tea green tea industry, which was dead, has now picked up and made money. I'm not, but the industry. So you could see some of the publications, natural products, a must for human survival in London, World Scientific Press, <laughs> Journal of uh, yeah, Therapeutic Areas of Flavonite from Ceylon Green Tea and Hypoxic Brain Epithelium Cells, and these are some of the uh, natural products we have done. Then, what I want to say is, you have, you have to hang, you have to uh, bang and get the money to go ahead. You don't have to go to the government. I mean, and here we started uh, histopathology, and uh, we have in the department, I mean, actually we should have been clear. I mean, we, uh, this is my first dean, who said the modern visual aids and television monitors to help the study of histology were all installed according to the visions of Dr. Ronnie So I was the first lecturer, and this is what we have done, right? And uh, so where did the money come? There was no money. Then, of course, we had to contact the Japanese aid, and I had to use my personal uh, uh, 
contact who was the president Jawa Jawadana, who was the late president Jawadana, had a direct access to uh, to the Japanese government, and these are all signed by him and Japanese ambassadors show my contribution, and we got a huge grant from Japan to get us to go ahead. Right? Then from there, I mean, National Institute of Health, USA, they came in when I was struggling, and my lab is as a result of the donations what we got from National Institute of Health to set up the first national brain bank in Sri Lanka. We have a hospital imager and an image analyzer. And we have set up some uh, collaboration with National Institute of Health in New Hands, uh, that is in Bangalore, India, a UC College, London, Imperial College, George Washington, UC School of Medicine and Health, and UC Journal of South Wales. And 14 of my research uh, uh, assistants have received full fellowship in training abroad. I mean, this is one of the highest in the entire, entire university, right? Uh, and uh, as far as uh, uh, workshops are concerned, I have conducted, as for development of human resources in 1999, 2004, 2006, and now this is a 2012. And we have got 33 resource personnel, except that uh, 2012, from Australia, India, Italy, Canada, Hong Kong, Sweden, Netherlands, Korea, Japan, Singapore, USA, UK. And we have got, we have trained 121 participants, Sri Lanka 103, and 18 from neighboring countries like Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Singapore, Thailand, Sweden, and we have got double grants also, right? So obviously you could see, uh, with the, with the, the ambassador of uh, Robert O. Blake from US, and um, they opened, they gave us the equipment and we set up the neuroscience uh, laboratory. And then, uh, this is the first, you could see, of the John Nichols, who started in 99, the ball rolling. And this is, uh, he was the president of uh, in group, Professor Albert Agayo. And uh, we have Professor Ken Muller, who was, uh, Dr. Uh, Nicholas was, uh, Professor Nicholas was uh, 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 talking, right? And so, so therefore, I mean, if you hit at the door, the door opened. Um, then, of course, one of my study students what is now doing a PhD, actually completed the PhD, and that is, uh, we have collected 76 uh, cases of uh, autopsy brains, and we have collected 42 from India. So it's a joint study between India and uh, Sri Lanka, and this is some of our work, right? And this is not a medical uh, person. We did this pathology. And you could see the detailed pathology in Sri Lankan brain, number A. It's a no clinical history, but neuropathologically only confirmed to back stage 5 and 6. And the characteristic E root and rectangles and murex amyloid plant. So B, a clinically diagnosed for 12 years with Parkinson diseases, but actually it was uh, not Parkinson and it was supranuclear palsy. So ultimately, this is in Sri Lanka. This is some of the work we did in Indian brain, right? And uh, what is a, uh, a, a clinically diagnosed as dementia and neuropathologically confirmed to frontotemporal lobe degeneration. But um, these are not details uh, clinically. What, what my point I wanted to get across was we have done a, one of the most extensive ever work across two countries. And we have done the Alzheimer's pathology. These are all in the chemistry. We have done the Alzheimer's, we have done the Parkinson's, progressive supranuclear dementia with Lewis body, multiple systemic property with dementia, cerebral amyloid and, uh, and angiography. Uh, I mean, we could see, we have basically done in this brain the gene, the histopathology, the vascular, everything we have done, right? So this is where we started with nothing and this is how we are going. We are getting international cooperation and this paper we are writing now. Uh, and this is one of the uh, one of the papers that has come in, come out in the Indian Journal of Psychiatry. But uh, the the real paper is still we are doing the statistics and we are going to write them. And uh, we didn't stop at uh, stop at uh, uh, at um, academic level, but we also went to the public. And you could see um, this is uh, Professor Anne Cato from uh, Geneva uh, University of Geneva and Professor Gaiba Cato. We went to North. And did a public brain awareness day, Japna, right? And this is a tsunami development area in the south. I think this is in two years. 
So I'd like to, uh, to discuss it a little bit more about how you can do things. I mean, you've seen one way you can do it, and that's a heroic way. Not all of us are heroes. And uh, I think the way to get into it is to just begin by explaining the academic ladder. Okay, there were some questions that came up about, you know, if you're going to work at a university, if you're going to take an academic career, what are the hoops you have to jump through to be able to do that? And then we'll come back to this question about how you do it. At the, uh, about how to go about doing it. All right, so you first are going to start with a bachelor's degree. Let's say it's a BS. A BS degree, that's probably what you're all working on. And, uh, and then, you, uh, uh, if you want to progress all the way to the top, at the top of the academic field, you're going to need to get a PhD. All right? So the next step is to get a PhD. And that's graduate school. Now, it depends on, uh, on where you're working what country you're working in and you're going to get the PhD from, you may have to get an MSc along the way. In some countries, that's a requirement. But in others, like the United States and many countries in Europe, you don't have to have an MSc. In the United States, you just go straight for the PhD. In science, in biology, particularly. If you were in the arts, that would be a different matter. Okay, so for the PhD, it's going to, uh, on the average, in the United States, it takes about six years. If, uh, if you have to get an MSc someplace, it would be uh, three years to get, two or three years to get the MSc, and then three or four years get the uh, PhD. So it totals out to about six years to get a PhD. And, uh, and then if you want to go into an academic career, well, there are two ways you can go to the PhD. You can go on in an academic career, or you can go off into industry. You can work with a uh, drug company, biotech, any number of things. Perhaps all of you know someone who's gone in, uh, no, actually, you can't go into industry here. You have a very hard time going directly to the PhD in the industry. I mean, sometimes you can do it, but the industry wants you to have a postdoctoral training, just like academia.
so you need to take a postdoctoral fellowship. And that's anywhere from three to five years. It then depends upon how hard it is to get a faculty position out there. Sometimes it can go on longer than that, seven or eight years, to get a post to do a postdoctoral fellowship. And then from here, you can go into industry. Pretty easy. Or you go on into academics. And the first step from a postdoc is to become an assistant professor. So you, that's the lowest position in most universities. Now some universities will hire you as an instructor. But that, that's not a tenure line. Most people, if they're going to want a university to have an appointment, they're going to want to be able to earn tenure. They're going to want to be able to have a position that will be guaranteed for life. And so if you want to be on the tenure track, you have to start as an assistant professor. And that lasts for six years. And then you become an associate professor. And with the associate professor comes tenure. And what tenure means that the university says that we are hiring you forever for the rest of your life. You're going to have a, you're going to have an income unless you really screw up. If you don't show up for classes, if you just stay at home, if you don't do your job, then they, they, can, they can rescind that. But if you're ordinary, just you have to do your stuff, then you're going to have a job. And then about five years after that, you become a full professor. And that's really the top of the line. Some places have a little bit higher, but it's, it's nonsense. The full professor is, is where the money's at. OK. So that's for the academic line. Now, I, I don't think these names necessarily apply here in Sri Lanka. I think you have uh, lecturer or you know, senior lecturer, readers, and so forth. But it's basically the same, the same division. The names change. All right. So let's take a look at these in some detail. Okay. So you go from the BS. You want to get to a PhD to earn a PhD. So you want to apply to a PhD program. I don't think you have a PhD program. Uh, many fields of biology here, although uh, Renil is trying to develop an MSc program here, uh, which will be helpful, and I'll tell you how in a minute. So if you're going to apply to a graduate school to get a PhD, you'd probably uh, go to, uh, to Europe or to the United States or to India or to Japan or Australia. All of those places have good PhD programs. China as well, Korea, South Korea. So there are a lot of places that one could apply for a PhD. And it depends on where you want to go. If you want to go, to, you have to make up your mind yourself. If you want to go to the United States, you have to go and look up a particular university. You'd have to say to yourself, what do I want my PhD in? And uh, if you say, I want my PhD in neuroscience, you uh, actually you can go to Ebro and it will tell you all of the PhD programs. You go to the Ebro website, the IBRO website, it will tell you all the PhD programs in neuroscience that there are. I think they have all listed there. 
and they'll have links that you can click on that will take you right to the websites of those programs and will tell you what the requirements are to get in. And, uh, and if you don't find them at their either a website, then you have to go find them yourself. And you can pick universities you've heard of. you do wind up applying, you want to pick people to write letters of recommendation, people who know you and like you, but also people who have some position, some stature. You would need to get someone high up, say, in the university, someone with some credentials. Ron L would do fine, but also others as well. The head of the Department of Biomechanics would be a good letter of recommendation. Someone with some authority within the university. Someone, if you pick, uh, if you pick someone that's, that's a low level in the university to write the letters of recommendation, the people who read the letters say, well, I mean, who are these people? Do they know? What are their standards? Usually when somebody is high up in the university, they say, well, they know what they're talking about. So you want to pick a friend, pick someone that, that, that knows you and you feel likes you and someone with some authority to write the letters of recommendation. So you're going to need all these things to get into a PhD program. Now, when you go for a PhD program, uh, I, in the United States, you can't pay your way. Maybe perhaps in other countries you can't. Uh, pay your way, but uh, in the United States, you are covered. Your you, uh, your 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 tuition and your uh, uh, your stipend, your living stipend, uh, an annual uh, a monthly income to live off of, all of that is covered when you go in. And uh, and there are different ways to have that financing covered. Some universities have grants that will cover it. <coughs> but most of those grants that they have are for their citizens, right? They're coming out of taxpayer money. And so they would be for their citizens. And it's difficult for foreign citizens to get uh, the local support that way. What very often happens for foreign citizens is, is that they have to teach while they're going to graduate school so many hours. It's not awful. I mean, a lot of, awful lot of graduate students do that. And so you're a teaching assistant. And this will pay your tuition and will pay you a stipend. It's quite comfortable. You can live off of it and do very well. But the force of it is, is that you can't buy your way in. They select you and then the money is there to take care of you, get you all the way through. And you won't come out of a graduate school unless you are buying a house or something that's, that's really over the top. Okay. Now, when you apply to, to a PhD program, you will apply, you will apply to the program, to the university. They'll sometimes ask you to, in addition to applying that to them, to write individual professors within that university with whom you would like to work, and to ask them if they have an open, they might be taking a graduate student uh, in, uh, in, the, in the year you want to come, in the next year. And 
and to establish some kind of contact. Tell them that you have read about their work, refer to the papers that you have read, and that you would like to work in their lab to learn how to do what they're doing, and to get some response back from them. Now look, all of us, at least once or twice a week, get uh, emails from students in countries like Sri Lanka and elsewhere that will say, uh, I want to work in your lab. I really uh, am a hard worker. I write. Uh, and you can tell, though, that they don't know a thing about what I'm doing. They don't have the slightest idea. And frankly, I can tell from uh, what they're saying, what little that they've done, is that, uh, that they don't, they're not even suitable for it. And I just delete it. You have to show that, that, that you've actually read what it is um, that that lab works on and, that, uh, and, and indicate that you want to work on that. Okay. Um, now, another thing that's going to be important in getting into a graduate school is you're going to need to have some research experience to get in. It's really hard now for people to go to graduate school in the United States or Europe, my guess is also in India, unless you've had some kind of research <laughs> at the BS or at the MS level, that you have actually worked on independent research. The graduate programs want to know that when you come in, you understand what it is you're getting into, that you really understand what research is all about. It's a tremendous investment for them to bring someone from, say, Sri Lanka to, to, to over to their country and to set you up and to get you going in the program if you don't really know that you like to do research and that's what you want to do. Okay, so right there, that's, that's a wake-up call for you. Because many of you don't have direct research experience, and you don't really have the facilities to do. Well, actually, I'm speaking out of turn. I don't know. But I do know that Renil is trying to develop this MSC program that will give experience to biology that will make it possible for them to go uh, and, and you can apply abroad. You know, there are summer schools for students like you. Summer schools in, in, uh, in, in Italy, uh, there's one in France, there's one in England, and I know what there's one in um, uh, Hong Kong. There are several in the United States. You can't even get into the summer school unless you have some research experience before you get in, before you apply. You've got to get some research experience. Now, I do understand, uh, I have heard from Ranil that there are laboratories scattered throughout the country that actually are doing experimental research. And so if you want to apply to a graduate school somewhere, you need to attach to one of those laboratories. In fact, we've heard some talks today where people have done that in, uh, in Colombo and in various other places. So getting a research background, establishing in your record that you, you have done some research, some indication that, that you have a, a, a good sense for it, and so that the people who write your letters can say, this person can actually do research. They're willing to sit down and to beat their head against the wall until they get uh, an answer. And, uh, and they are collegial. They do get along well in the lab, and they show up every day, and they don't get depressed when things don't work, and they do, you know, the whole, the whole thing. You need to know. Okay. So once you get the PhD, then then things get a lot easier. You get a PhD, it's a good PhD, you get it published, and 
then you can apply directly to people for a postdoctoral fellowship. You can apply to, to, to anyone anywhere in the world. By that time, by the time you've written your PhD, you should know in your field who the leaders are. You should have read that as part of the literature search that you're doing for your PhD. You've read lots of papers in your area, and you know who's doing the best work. And, uh, and you can apply to any one of them. And if you're on, and you should be, uh, as you get earning your PhD, you will attend meetings in Singapore, and in India, and uh, in Europe, uh, perhaps anywhere on the, on the Pacific Rim. You'll be meeting other people like you. You'll be talking to them about who's really doing what in the field, and who's a good person to work with, and, and that. That sort of thing. And you, you need to talk to, to your people here. Renil would be a good person to talk to and other leaders uh, here about who would be to good work with. So doing science is, is not like being an artist where you can go off in a garret somewhere and paint all by yourself. I mean, when you do science, you have to communicate with other people up with what's going on, who's doing what, who's doing interesting things, where there might be a position open. You're constantly talking about this kind of stuff. So you can apply to anybody for a postdoc. And you'll do a postdoctoral fellowship with pure research. There's no teaching. And, and again, your salary will be covered. Now, the thing is that that the person that you want to work with may not have funds to support a postdoctoral fellow. Okay? You're applying to an individual lab. It's not a university. It's an individual lab within the university. And he has to come up with his own funds to support his own or her own postdoctoral fellows. And so he or she may not have money in the grant to support another postdoctoral fellow. Maybe they already have a few, and, uh, and they just don't have enough. And so they'll write back to you and say, well, uh, you know, your, your, your application really looks good, and, and your thesis uh, work that you published really looks terrific, but I just don't have the funds. And, and, and uh, I mean, this person could say, but I will help you apply for a postdoctoral fellowship uh, uh, grant from an institution. And if, and if he doesn't say that, you can say that. Uh, you know, I would be happy to apply to a postdoctoral, for a postdoctoral fellowship with some institution or some agency. Uh, would you be willing to help me do that? And if this person says yes, then you be willing to, that's a good sign because it means the person cares and is going to help you write that fellowship. If the person says no, it's a good thing. This is not the kind of person want to work with. They're never, if they're not going to help you now, they're never going to help you. Okay? So you're going to need to have apply for a fellowship, and, uh, and you're going to need a postdoctoral fellowship. And once the postdoctoral fellowship is done, then you have the choice of going into industry, a drug company, a biotech company, and so forth, and so on. Or you can start the, up the, the ladder. Uh, of the academic ladder into the university. Uh, and when you apply for an assistant professorship, you have to uh, apply to a university for jobs. Universities advertise. They say we have an assistant professorship available in, uh, in nutrition or in pharmacology or uh, that would fit, uh, fit maybe your qualifications, and you would apply for that job. And again, you'd have to have letters of recommendation in the same room why. You want to get the letters from somebody who knows you and people with some prestige. And so, uh, and then you'd have to be invited, you'd have to give a talk, and they, they meet you and decide whether or not they want to hire you on their faculty. And then, uh, and then, uh, then they would hire you, and then you would have to set about writing a research grant. And, uh, and so you would have to apply to an agency that could give you a grant. Um, yeah. So you, 
would get to get you would get a research grant, and uh, and you would want to get promoted to an associate professor with tenure within six years. And for this, you're going to need to have a research grant. You need to have published about one paper per year, depending upon how hard the research is. Um, you need about five or six publications, and uh, and you need to do some service within the institution that you're in. You've got to teach. Then, and then you get uh, your professorship and tenure, and, uh, and then you, uh, you keep publishing, you bring in the grants, you get an international reputation, and, uh, and you become a full professor. Okay, so those, those, those are kind of the realities if you're thinking about going further east, north, or west to go to graduate school somewhere. And if you're thinking about a career in academia. So again, the best bet I think for, for most of you is to look for somebody here in the country that you can get research experience with. And if you have already done some research here and it's been published, you're in a pretty good shape to uh, to go uh, to go out and go to graduate school in another country. And, uh, and yeah, so that that should be something that that you should try to do it, and and and, uh, and, and wish and, and do everything you can to help Renil get this MSc program off the ground, so that uh, that there will be a broad training program for young people to be able to go and get the results. Of it. Now, finally, I want I want to say that if you're going to leave the country. For, for training, that uh, there are going to be some of you that are not going to come back. That's just the way it is. Uh, and the reasons for that are many. I mean, many of you will leave the country single, and while you're doing your graduate work or a postdoc, you're going to get married, you're going to have kids. And you're going to wave, well, my kids are going to be better off growing up there or here. Will my spouse move here be happy? So you've got problems, and, and very often people don't come back. But the hope should be that you will come back, and eventually will come back. Because that's the only way things are going to improve here, is by you going out and then, and then coming back and bringing what you've learned uh, to, to uh, Sri Lanka to make it strong. Um, it, it seems to some of us that the way to do that that would help it is if the government here uh, would fund graduate students to go abroad to, to universities and, uh, and get PhDs or postdoctoral training with the understanding that if they got the funding that they would have to come back. And that works for some South American countries um, to some extent. Okay. Um, so, Ranel, do you, you, did you want to say anything about the master's program that, uh, that you have in mind? Is, you, is, it, is it far enough along to be able to say anything at all about it? Our biggest problem I mean, in getting the MSc program here is uh, we do not have, I mean, you could see, I mean, I have been trying to get as much as possible Sri Lankans to come today uh, and to share their experience. For some reason, we got only three people coming in. Um, so, I mean, we have a big problem of human resources. And I am very thankful, I mean, Professor. Uh, McMahon has been kind enough to us to help us to write in the grant proposal so that we could get at least I mean, some other uh, faculty from outside and uh, India is so close by and India has done wonderful research and we can get some of the Indians to come in. So therefore, I mean, it will be my next, uh, you know, a task would be to get the funding and we might get some funding from the university and the UGC and by some collective 
So obviously, uh, I mean, it's a huge task because there is a big problem. It has, it has, I mean, if you can there are spotters everywhere, you name it, PCR, I mean, you, uh, what it is, uh, sequences, real-time PCR, on focal my everything is absolutely underutilized or not utilized at all. Humans are scattered around this country. It's the problem we have is the human resources. So if we can get that, uh, that bridge from the Pro or, or from NIH, I mean, then of course, I mean, as I have shown, a way to the Sri Lankans to be able uh, to uh, master a, a progress in this area. Right. Thank you. Okay. So there you have it. Uh, it it seems a little bizarre if you think about it, and it will probably occur to you uh, later on today that uh, the university here has gone to the trouble to bring us in to tell you about the marvels of, of modern neuroscience. And, uh, and you have sat here for more than a week listening to the marvels of neuroscience and the things that can be done. And then at the end, to have us tell you, well, you can't do that. And that's not our intention at all. Our intention is to turn you on to, uh, to all of the possibilities of science, to get you excited about it. Because you can find a way. I mean, Ranil found a way. And, 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 and it's, it's in your hands. And there are going to be some of you, like Ranil did uh, 15 years or so ago, who are going to be so stimulated that you're going to find a way to make it happen. We're just saying that the, that the road is tough. Did you want to say anything about India? I mean, since, uh... So the system in India is very similar. Uh, if, you, if you want to apply to graduate school, and other than the fact that we don't have the national level graduate record exam, which is an international exam. Other than that, the application procedure is much the same. You have to write to a university, you have to find out as to how to apply for admission into a PhD program. We don't really have any university in India that gives an MSc in neurosciences. There are MSc programs in many, many universities. But as far as I know, there isn't one which is specific as an MSc. No, There's one actually in GYD, the University of GYD. Yeah, the University gives one. Yeah, it's not possible. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's the only place that we do. But each place has its own requirements as to what they will expect in terms of your qualifications. Like for an MSc program, you would require a BSc. For a PhD program, you might require a BSc and BSc. So you'll have to find out as to what the requirements are. Now, in, 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 in the TIFR, Data Institute of Fundamental Research, which I have been for, we are deemed a university. And we have our qualifications for a PhD are basically in any branch of science. Now, if you have an MSc, you cover at some level, and if you have a BSc, you come to but it's a, a bachelor's degree in any branch of science, basic science, or an applied science like engineering or medicine. Or so as long as you have a background in some science, you can apply to this. But that is not true of all places in the country. Some places have been said that you need an MSc in some specific disciplines. That you would have. In fact, uh, what I'm trying to foresee is whether some of the students would work with uh, in Indian labs. Because we have a problem of our resource. And I took this matter up with the foreign ministry and the minister himself. And uh, the next time with the Sri Lanka, because they are either in the Sri Lanka found uh, by uh, the Indian government, he just is putting a lot of money into that. And so we want to see uh, the answer in uh, High Commissioner. In Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka High Commission in India comes to Sri Lanka next time. There is going to be a discussion with me. And
and see how we could write, find out the MOU with either the Indian Academy on the side or whatever way. And uh, perhaps we want some students to come to some project during the MSc or PhD or whatever it is. So they have to, and the minister himself uh, agreed that they will see the possibility once the uh, president is in Sri Lanka. Okay, so I think we've just about exhausted this uh, topic. Uh, if any of you had any questions, uh, now's the time to answer them because we're not going to be here much longer. So do you, do you have any, any questions about what we've said so far? Um, I, hope, I hope I haven't ended, on, ended this on a downer. It, it's not a downer. I mean, you have a good example of how this all can lead to success. So, Ranil, did you want to uh, hand out the uh, yeah. certificates? Now, it's a closing ceremony where we have to uh, uh, award uh, this, uh, the certificate of participation because this is, place is a bit crowded and, you know, it takes some time. We thought uh, that uh, we will uh, have it at downstairs. So, the uh, camera will go and then after that, please uh, follow the camera and then, uh, Thank you.